I was born in Kansas in 1884 and lived in Topeka till I was 18, moved to New York, and lived in New York until I was 45, never once wishing that I could have a garden. Then my husband, we had been married just a few months, and he said, would you like to live in the country? And without even knowing that I would, I said, oh, yes. And he bought this place, and we hadn't been here more than 10 minutes, and I wasn't out there looking at the lilac bush and the apple trees and so on. And immediately, I got thrilled about gardening. Knew nothing about it. had a place twice too big, plowed up, and my brother and one or two other people told me what to do, and I did it for almost 15 years according to the way everybody else was doing it, with commercial fertilizer and poison spray and plowing. Hired a man to come and plow, and the plowman was always late, and I was always dying to get out there and get things in earlier than I could. Now, this is how this happened, the, the way I garden now. One morning in early April, I went out to the garden, couldn't do anything, just went out to shed a tear because I couldn't begin to plant. The plowman hadn't come. I walked over to the asparagus, and I said, we don't have to plow for you. Why do we have to plow for the other vegetables? And the asparagus said, you don't. Go ahead and plant. If the asparagus had said that to anybody with any sense, they wouldn't have paid any attention. They would have said, well, you're a perennial because asparagus, like a tree, you're like a rose bush, just comes up every year. But anyway, since I wasn't very smart, I just ran and got my seeds and planted them. And that's been going on for uh, 35 years. I never had a plowman again. If I told you that the way I garden is very little work, you wouldn't know what I mean because you don't know what I call very little work. You might think that I meant I only work six hours a day instead of 12. So I'm going to tell you exactly how I garden. I have a vegetable garden, 45 by 50, in which I grow vegetables for two people all the year round. i sorry to make you jealous, but I haven't been in a supermarket for at least 14 years. I grow all the vegetables for the two of us, freeze the surplus, and do all of that work myself. I have a few flower beds, not big ones, but a few. I do all that work. I do all of my housework, my cooking, and I answer a terrible lot of mail, and I never do any of this after 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, the hands go up. I, your hands are going to go up and ask me what time I get up, and my answer to that is, somewhere between six and eight, according to when I feel like it and when I want to. And the first thing is a long, leisurely breakfast, Roman style, stretched out on the couch. But I'm all through with all of this after, a late, after 11 o'clock in the morning. The reason is that I never plow or spade or cultivate or weed or hoe or use a fertilizer or use a poison spray or use a compost pile or water. I just plant and pick. The reason that I can do all this is because I keep my ground covered all year long on hay mulch, which rots, fertilizes the ground, keeps down the weeds, keeps the ground soft, and that's all there is to it. I had these uh, turnips in here all winter long, and uh, I've picked most of them. 
They're, they look awfully little, but that's because I picked all the big ones. But there are a few left. We'll eat those. And now we'll put in a row of parsley and a row of dill. Here's the, we eat them together, so we plant them together, why not? Now all, all you do, all I do anyway, Just sprinkle the seeds. Now I never, I never uh, really cover seeds the way most people do. Little seeds like this, I just, I just pat the row a little bit, and they're planted. And the same with the dill. Since weed seeds can come up all over your garden without your fooling around planting them, I don't see why the other things can't too, so now they're, they're planted. That's it for the parsley and dill. Now I'm going to plant some potatoes. No, I'm not going to call it planting. Anybody, everybody wouldn't dream of planting potatoes like this, but uh, I, I can think of no reason why not. They grow. They come up and you get potatoes, and I guess that's what you want when you plant potatoes, is potatoes. Well, those are a little too close. See, I had these in the house all winter, and then they begin to sprout, and then instead of throwing them away, you just come and throw them on the ground. And uh, later on in the year, you come out and pick some potatoes very simple. I would be willing to bet that 99 out of 100 people who see me do this wouldn't do it themselves. But uh, that doesn't bother me. That's it. Potatoes are planted. <laughs> We're through with that job. Get some hay on top of those potatoes. Otherwise, they would just lie there and die. And we don't want them to die, so we'll do this. This, this keeps the, you see, most people would cut, cut those potatoes up with just one sprout in each, in each piece of potato, but you don't have to, and I don't do anything I don't want to do unless I have to, and I don't have to. So there we are. I'm covering these potatoes because if I didn't, the sun would just bake them and they would die. I just keep, I just keep the sun off of them and uh, they will grow right through the hay. You can't, you can't do this with a hard hay or they couldn't get through. I never put any hay on top of seeds. 
The hay around the garden is for two things. The main thing is to fertilize your soil. But the other thing that the hay does is keep your ground moist. In all of the over 35 years that I have planted this way, I have never had to water once. As I plant all my seeds now, I take just a little cottonseed meal and sprinkle it right with the seeds. Just in case it does rain too much, cottonseed meal supplies the nitrogen that plants have got to have. My father had a 40-acre farm, but he was superintendent of schools. He wasn't a farmer, really. However, he sold a few things like strawberries and so on. I was always top as a picker because I lived right there and I knew where the best ones were. <laughs> My mother was a person who never told her nine children what to do and what not to do. And she said, I just pay attention to my inner voice. And since I wouldn't think of doing anything that somebody else tells me, how on earth could I be so unfair as to go around telling anybody else what to do? Thee follow thy inner voice and I'll follow mine. My father was not as noticeable that way as my mother, but uh, he also didn't interfere. My father said to me once, Ruth, it's good to think for yourself, but just once in a long time, couldn't you think like other people? And I asked him, like who? And he changed the subject. My mother never, never, never scolded. But she had tricks. She could protect herself. For instance, she loved to read. But uh, in those days, you couldn't go to your bedroom and read in the wintertime because you didn't heat your bedroom, of course. And the only place she could read in the winter would be in the living room, which was warm. With nine children, don't tell me that you couldn't sit there and read for a few hours and not have some of the children come in and interrupt you, you see. But she had her little trick. She'd sit down to read, and she'd have a basin of very cold water right there by her side with a washcloth in it. And if any of us would come in to ask her something, she would just say, oh, come here, come closer, dear. I didn't hear what you said. What did you... Oh, honey, your face is dirty. Do you think we'd go near her when that basin of water was there? <laughs> no, indeed. What I feel I know for sure is... Do what you want to do and don't tell other people how to behave. To make rules for other people, I just don't get it. For instance, when I helped Carrie Nation smash the loons, that was a big thing they shouldn't do that, you see. Well, now when I take a drink, I say, forgive me, Carrie Nation, I've got to have a little drink. <laughs> Yes, I helped her smash saloons. Carrie Nation was a woman who lived in Kansas, and in Kansas, it was against the law to sell liquor. And she went around to places and came to Topeka, where we lived. She would get a group of people together, mostly women, and they would go to a drugstore or someplace which was illegally selling liquor. By the way, I was 16 years old. It was in 1900. And this crowd of women gathered at the state house and then walked down the street. And, uh, of course, the policemen knew Carrie Nation was in town, so they kind of followed us. And Carrie Nation went up to this drugstore, which she had found out was selling liquor illegally. And she smashed one of the big panes in front, and I went and smashed the other one. And the policeman came up and arrested Carrie Nation and broke my heart. They didn't arrest me. I had to go home and go to Sunday school. There's nothing dull about gardening, I can tell you that. You saw the raccoon cage. Well, for raccoons, that outside fence doesn't do any good. They just get over that and then eat your corn. They don't eat anything else but corn. And I got so desperate trying to protect my corn that my brother built that cage for me. I don't know whether I told you how I finished one of my articles about the raccoons. 
I finished the article by saying, now, of course, the raccoons can't get my corn, but they're so smart that when they figure out how to go in there and open the door and go and eat my corn, I'm just going to go back to the house, get on the couch, drink two daiquiris instead of one, and forget it all. <laughs> really? Why did you give them a key? <laughs> That's right. Why didn't I? <laughs> Here you'll see a little row of lettuce, and here's a row of carrots. It isn't acting quite normal, but who's normal, huh? Now, the sweet Spanish onions are doing very nicely, and that little potato, well, it just came up, and we'll let it stay there, why not? And what's that? Another potato just jumped there. Let it alone. What the devil is this? That's a weed. Out with it. <laughs> it's fantastic what you can do growing your own things. It really is. And my rhubarb is just, well, I say to everybody, if you want a rhubarb root, please tell me, because I've got to get rid of some of it. It spreads and grows. Now, I don't know how many people are interested in soybeans, but they are full of protein, as I guess we know. But almost nobody grows soybeans, because if you go and buy soybeans in a market, they don't taste very good. But if you grow your own soybeans, they are absolutely delicious. I've had 7,000 people from every state in Canada to come and look at the garden. I keep a book where they write their names, you see. I tell you right now, my husband has been dead for 15 years, and living alone like this, I don't know what on earth I would do if I didn't have this garden thing to write about, to help people with, to talk to garden clubs. I don't know how I could feel that I was doing anything that made it necessary for me to stay alive. I don't lecture a garden club. I talk maybe for five minutes, and then it's open to questions. It's not a talk, it's a conversation. I don't think I could have gone through it year after year, getting up, yep, 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 you know, trying to say the same old thing over and over. When they ask me what I charge, I say, whatever you give your most highly paid speaker, that sounds conceited, but it is because I found out that they give the highest amount to people who tell you how to put flowers in a vase, and I've got something more important to tell you than that. That's an art in Japan. Flower what? what, dear? Flower arranging is an art in Japan. In Japan. Well, it would never, never occur to me to tell any other grown human being how to put some flowers in a vase. Mmm, this is so good. I bet you're an awfully good cook, are you? Mmm, -mm. this is so good. These are awfully good. This is delicious. Well, when I'm invited out to lunch, I never eat a bite of breakfast. When I'm invited out to dinner, I never eat a bite of lunch. <laughs> I like to be nice and hungry. We'd like more wine. Not too much. Like Thank you. Know. That's fine. I, I think we're all going to get a little high on this wine. I'm a little high already. <laughs> Did I tell you that I was 45 years old when I found out that people actually behaved the way somebody else told them to, like Emily Post? When Fred told me that Emily Post had written a whole book about it, well, I couldn't wait to read. I, I, I got hold of that book right away, and here I read this book. Do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, and I couldn't believe it. Behaving properly, for heaven's sake. This woman down the road, a very rich woman, invited me to a formal dinner party. You know, RSVP and wear so-and-so. Uh, -so. Uh, what do they call it? Black tie or something like that. I wrote her back. I liked her, but I said, I'm sorry I can't come to your party because if I did, I would embarrass you. I wouldn't know how to behave. I wouldn't know what to wear. I would do all the wrong things, and you would be upset. And I thought that would finish me with her. 
And the next day, somebody knocked on the door, and here was one of her servants with a great big bunch of beautiful flowers for me. So at least it didn't make her mad. <laughs> She's nice. I've been there a few times since. But not to a formal party, for heaven's sake. Huh? I couldn't go to a formal party. I loved my husband very, very much. I really mean it when I say that I'm sure that he is the only man in the world who could have stood staying married to me because I always was out of order. I mean, the things I did, I would go down there to garden, and the minute I got down there, I would take off all my clothes and garden naked. I've always loved the air on my body. And I never said a word to Fred about it one way or the other. It never occurred to me to mention it to him. And I came back every evening around 5 o'clock and put my clothes on before I came back. And one day I came back at 6. And Fred was out in the barn doing his stuff. He made all these wooden things and so on. And shortly after I got in, he came in and he said, Oh, you worked longer today, didn't you? I said, But how did you know? I was just curious how he happened to know. And he said, it was easy. As a rule, as the cars go along the road, after 5 o'clock, they just go on. But up until 5 o'clock, they kind of go very slowly and then lo look down where you're gone. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I knew that you didn't come up until 6, because up until 6, they still stopped. I just am, by nature, an optimist. The pleasant idea comes instead of the depressing one. I couldn't admire anybody any more than I admired my grandfather. He always knew exactly the right thing to do and to say with everybody. I don't mean correct thing, of course. I mean the helpful thing. My oldest brother had a dog that he was crazy about, and the dog died. My two oldest brothers were out where I could see them from the window, burying the dog. And the tears were rolling down my cheeks because I was sorry for my brother. And my grandfather came in the room and he saw what was going on. And he said, oh, come here, Ruth, I want to show you something. He took me over to the other side of the room and he said, here's the rose bush that you planted yourself. And look, it has a flower on it. You can go out and pick a flower off of your own rose bush. I started out, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Thee was looking out of the wrong window, dear.'"